I'm Daniel, I'm Chief Technology Officer uh, at CINC, and we are here with our partner, uh, GitLab. And the, again, the idea is not to, to, to sell anything, it's just to share best, pra best practices and have a conversation with you all. Our goal is to help each other, right? How to become more productive um, working from home. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, invite our friends from GitLab to, to start the presentation right now. Thanks, thanks GitLab for being here with us as well. Thanks for having us. Uh, no, we're, we're looking forward to it. And uh, I think for everyone on the call, um, you know, this is a, a, a partnership that uh, uh, we love to take advantage of in all different ways, including opportunities like this where we happen to have a lot of expertise. It's not what we sell. <laughs> But it happens to be something that we've invested seven years of work in becoming expert at, and that is running the world's largest remote organization. So we have uh, over 1,200 employees uh, across 65 or so countries now, and we run our entire organization with no office anywhere in the world. So to do that, we've developed a lot of capabilities um, and a lot of practices that we've found are really effective uh, to make our company uh, efficient that we are finding our, uh, you know, that seven years of experience building that up uh, can be adapted very quickly by, by a lot of uh, our partners and customers that are much more rapidly moving into either a, a temporary or even a longer term uh, remote uh, situation. So really appreciate everyone joining. Um, we're going to go through some material but we also want this to be very much an interactive uh, conversation. We know there's lots of questions on people's minds. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. And one thing that I will share just up front here, um, as we go through this, we'll do some introductions and a little bit of uh, uh, content, but we, and I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, actually, Brandon, if you just uh, maybe switch, switch it back to you. Uh, or just share the, the, the uh, Google Doc. Um, oh, sure. Let me switch and, uh, to the Google. And the reason I was going to show the Google Doc is that one of the things that we do that's very tactical, we'll talk about some big picture stuff, but very tactical, and I wanted to share it right up front on the call here, is we always use uh, some form of a shared document that can be co-edited during a call. For some customers, uh, uh, it's very effective to use Google Docs. For others, it might be Office 365. Whatever you have access to uh, can work, but the key is that we have one that we use during that call. In this case, we're using a Google Doc. And it allows for a large group of, of people on a call to have a very efficient conversation. And as we go, we always use numbered bullets. If we're talking here, and I think of a question that I wanna ask, uh, you know, uh, after we address this first question, I would just go to point number three here and start typing my question. And I'd, I'd put my name and I'd say, you know, my question is, you know, Brandon, you know, What's your favorite color? That would be red. Uh, <laughs> Except I wouldn't say it. I do. I could say it, and then anyone in the group, of course, can answer. Brandon, red. <laughs> what Brandon said exactly. And so we can all take notes together. But what it allows us to do is we can kind of queue up a lot of the questions, so you don't have to remember them, and you also don't have to interrupt, which is a little bit trickier on uh, on video calls than it is in person. Uh, to make sure we cover everything. And we'll go through that in order uh, as we have the conversation. So if you think of questions that you wanna ask, go ahead and just start adding them to that document and we'll make sure that we cover them as we get through the material. So um, with that, um, my name is Michael McBride. I'm Chief Revenue Officer here at GitLab. Um, I'm responsible for all of our customer facing activity, uh, including uh, services, support, uh, our customer success organization and sales. And uh, I'll let Brandon introduce himself. Sure. Uh, Brandon Young and I lead up alliances, and um, that focuses on our relationships with uh, with big clouds, with other system, in, with uh, ISVs, uh, and uh, also how, how do we help uh, our customers with just about a whole bunch of other random pieces. So uh, the alliances covers a pretty broad space. Uh, goal here in history, just so everyone knows, I've worked with CINT for twelve, like twelve years now. And so that's uh, also some of the context uh, that would bring, bring to the table. So one other highlight that uh, uh, we'd, I'd have here, Michael would also highlight here, we have a little link here, the slides. 
So one of the things you're going to find is we are big about sharing stuff ahead of time. Uh, what we find, of course, is it solves two, pro two things on that. One, it allows people to really get into the depth of what they want to cover. Uh, and it also solves the question of asynchronous, which we're going to dig into a little bit today. But uh, you're obviously welcome to click on those slides. Those are also shared. Uh, you'll know uh, the GitLab practice is to share as much as possible uh, because we truly believe at the core of the way GitLab operates, and we think probably a lot in this new world, that everyone can contribute. And in order to, for everyone to contribute, uh, you need to be as liberal as possible in giving them context. Uh, context helps enormously. And you'll find one last thing. We love links so that people can read it when they're not here. Uh, so this is kind of the way we're going to run it today. One of the things that's great about this, of course, is also after we leave today, anyone that wasn't able to make this meeting has a single place they can understand what happened in the meeting, as well as all the context of what happened. And that's going to become more and more important as we move to a fully remote space. And a lot of us move to handling and working with uh, kids that we're maybe now teaching. I've got three and they sit right out here. Uh, or we have uh, older uh, parents that we're going to be supporting through what is a tough time. So just some context there. Uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and switch a little bit over and I will actually present my screen. Uh, this is useful and pretty traditional that most people do a lot of presentations. We're going to try and do it both quickly here. So a couple things we want to go through uh, after the introductions in a little context of where we came from. This is GitLab is the world's largest all remote organization. Uh, we specifically say uh, all remote versus a number of other thing, a number of options, uh, because we want to specifically highlight the fact that there is no location, there's no base level that people are coming from, there's no home office, none of that. And so when we're very specific about that uh, statement, that's kind of what we're we're going through. A uh, couple of quick context, just size, and so we're the processes we're going to walk through today are just some things that we've learned at scale. Uh, and so 65 countries is about 1,200 GitLabbers. We also operate as a company, which is a bit different than necessarily others. Uh, as an open core company, we have a large number of external contributors. Uh, and so that's going to be both from our customers, but it's also going to be from a number of people that contribute to GitLab as a, uh, a core base. So, uh, some of these are pieces that we uh, need to interact with. Again, those 2,200 or 10,000 other contributors. So quickly, anyone, uh, forgive me, there we go. Um, so we believe it's a future work, but it does have its challenges. And it's come forward front and center, unfortunately, uh, in, a, in a tragic way for everyone. In a way that's a little faster than anyone I think would have expected. And certainly, obviously, no one really saw this coming. And so some of those are questions that have become a little more front and center that we need to address and questions that customers have asked us and partners have asked us, CINT. So we've actually did this before with CINT internally. Uh, and that's actually how we got here uh, as CINT was making the shift from obviously working globally as a global company, but to, uh, shifting to an all remote fit, at least in the interim, what are the questions that we need to an answer? And everyone's in this boat. So not unique to, to GitLab, not unique to CNT. Uh, the world has had to shift there. Some great sides for upsides. And I think these have been highlighted for a long time. Uh, the operational discipline uh, is a big piece of being fully remote. And we'll do a little there. Uh, a lot around efficiency uh, is very helpful. Obviously, the cost structure is great. Uh, the largest cost structure at GitLab capital structure is a MacBook. The rest of it is, uh, is, is very cost effective. So that's, that's a plus. And the opportunity to bring in and interact with people from every corner of the world from the 65 countries means that we get an amazing diversity of input, uh, of customer demand, of all the above. So your plus is, that said, there's some challenges. So we see this from, hey, workspace. Um, hey, my workspace, as it turns out, is an office, but I will tell you, right outside these two doors, I've got three kids working right now on homework. That didn't exist, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, that's something we will talk a bit about. That's one that fits different to everyone. Uh, but now your home is now your office. That's a little bit different. Communications, uh, how do we structure those communications? This is one that I think is people 
we may struggle a little bit with because uh, let's be honest, pe as people, we love the human action and the fidelity of a conversation often obscures the fact that act that what we communicated wasn't at the detail level we need. And it's certainly almost impossible to share that with anyone else. And so when you go to async, it becomes important that we think about it. And finally, the mindset. Uh, and this is going to be a big one, and we'll talk about it in a lot of detail. A couple of practices from our trials and tribulations, because we've made more than a few. Uh, you're going to see when you ask a question, every answer is a link. Why a link? Because we put it in something called the GitLab handbook. And the handbook for us is about three to 4,000 pages that we detail how we operate. And that forces a level of discipline and an ease of understanding. If someone needs to understand how to do something in the future, it's written down and it's a process that we all can follow. And so uh, this is a little bit counterintuitive and it may feel a little rigid, but it has become extraordinarily valuable uh, for us to operate as a company. And I think it may be something that others can pick up. Uh, expire. Oh, please jump in. One thing, one thing before you jump on the ex expiration, um, the, the link one is subtle, but yes. super important. You know, we've come to, to know how powerful that is here. Um, it's also um, indirectly saying have a single source of truth. So when you have a project team that has a long set of email threads that maybe not everybody's on, um, maybe there's uh, some documents that only some people have access to. If you settle on using a public link that anyone can access for all the information for a particular answer, a particular meeting, a particular decision, what it does is not only have it all in one place, but it also removes a lot of stress from the remote team because there's this stress of I'm missing out right now. And because I'm not in the office, it's harder for me to ask what I might, you know, overhear things and know what's going on. But if I know there will always be a single source of truth, it'll always be written down. And if I ask someone like, Hey, where are we on that? They'll be able to quickly send me one link and everything's in there. I don't have to stress as much. I don't worry as much about missing out because I know there's going to be an easy way to catch up. So that removes some of the pressure on, from your team to try to do things at odd times of day if they are in a different time zone. And uh, that link is really a much broader concept that is about being able to quickly and efficiently share things. So even if Brandon and I are having this conversation right now and I said, hey, Brandon, um, you know, would love to hear your thoughts about you know, how we should uh, you know, communicate remote uh, to some of our customers and partners instead of him having to go explain it to me, he said, oh, hey, let's have a chat. But before we, we chat, read this and this. And he would send a link to this d deck right here. And I'd be able to review that. And he'd set a link maybe to the ebook that we have that already has a lot of that context. And he said, take a quick look at that. And then we can discuss anything that you've got questions about. That makes our remote conversation actually the, the, detailed discussion of what matters as opposed to the review of what was already written down somewhere. Thanks. Michael. Yeah, no, that's, that's critical. And, and thank you. Um, the second piece here, when we talk about expiring uh, your Slack or teams messages, uh, this is important because it drives the previous point, which is if it's going to expire and it's not going to be around in 90 days, you're forcing the team and everyone to think to a single source of truth for anything that needs to be documented. Um, and that means it doesn't live in Slack or Teams. That is purely as a point of communication, which is great, but it's uh, ephemeral as it should be. Um, we focus meeting organizers should organize the meetings. You're going to see we're running through this right now. There's a deck that we're going to go through. There's questions, and we follow that. Uh, every meeting has a Google Doc link, like you all see here, and then it's going to have any details you want in it. Again, that allows anyone that's not here to jump right back in and also drives massive efficiency uh, for everyone that joins. Uh, there's other ways we're sure you could do this, but we'd recommend this one as a good starting point. Uh, it's worked real well for us. Um, DRI, pretty straightforward. Always have a directly responsible individual. Uh, reimburse, we also do some things. Uh, if you're interested in co-op working or office spaces, uh, less in at least number of places, those are also not options right now, but we do obviously have a number of people that fit there. Uh, and then finally, uh, focus on making sure you're real inclusive atmosphere uh, to the work. 
Um, again, I think it may become easier to be inclusive given we're all working from home. So, you know, you're going to get my children and I'm going to get your children and your dogs and other pieces. Uh, there's a lot of parts here that we include in uh, as you guys think about it. Um, talked a little bit, Michael hit this already, single source of truth. Uh, embracing that asynchronous workflow, really getting good at asynchronous is hard, uh, but it pays massive dividends. Uh, it also does a couple things, and then uh, that combined with really trust uh, will allow you to move much faster in a world where communication has changed quite a bit in how we do it. Uh, we talked a little bit about handbook first. Uh, this, we kind of joke inside, inside of GitLab when someone's new, uh, we joke, we're going to give you a link, which means you've been handbooked. We've given you a link to the handbook, and that is intended to give you a place to go back and reference for high fidelity when you need to understand it in the future, or more importantly, when you're going through growth and, and GitLab, we've gone through massive growth. How does one team or one individual that learned it today share it in a month when someone else joins their team? And when you get that kind of growth, uh, this, this process has worked really, really well for, for us. Uh, to be clear, I might not have said this, the handbook is public. It is one you're welcome to copy. We encourage you to use it however you would like. Uh, I think the only ask is if you find something you think we can do better, we'd love to hear from you through a merge request that says, hey, we found a better way to do this because by all means, we have not solved all these challenges and we are constantly iterating to make it better. Uh, a couple things, the asynchronous workflows, there's a couple ways we do it. Not surprisingly, we do, one of the primary ways we do it is put everything in an issue or a merge request. So uh, merge request certainly for code, but all of our teams from marketing, to sales, to alliances, uh, all leverage and use GitLab, in particular, uh, the issue tracking and uh, process flow. And that example for me, use that all the time when we are working with a large partner like Amazon and we're running a massive event that has so many workflows that we're doing at something say reInvent. Uh, how do we make sure that everyone knows what piece they're operating on, how it gets delivered exactly on time? Um, so when an issue is created for, issue tracking and project planning, use it and use it well. Uh, there's other tools that you can use here, obviously. Uh, we use GitLab because we're GitLab, uh, but there's other good options there as well, but stick to it uh, would be our recommendation. Uh, finally, a little bit of things we have spent time transitioning to remote. So there's one thing if you've been doing remote a lot, but if you're moving out, some really important pieces to thinking about it, and uh, this happened in a hurry. First off, it all comes from the top down and the executives have to be bought into it and they need to be working from home themselves. Why? Because what happens is if executives and a large and a team has a central place that they begin bringing people into, that becomes the way that all of the decisions get made and it becomes clear to everyone else and the communication process will not operate in the asynchronous, write it all down, share it. Because it takes more work initially uh, and so it's really important that the executives are bought into it. We'd really strongly suggest that everyone work from home. And that's why we say all remote, particularly while you're trying to learn this process. Uh, build your own tool stack, be opinionated on it, and stick to it. Uh, and then talk a little bit about this. Iterate, 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 and treat everyone as remote, which comes kind of again from that executive down viewpoint. Uh, our utility belt that we use pretty much, this is what almost everything exists. Zoom we're on. Slack for conversations. Uh, one of the things around Slack we'd encourage is use channels instead of one-on-one -on -one and encourage everything to be in a channel if at all possible. Clearly one-on-ones make sense. There's reasons to have them, but try to have it all in a channel that allows everyone to contribute and everyone to have context. Uh, GitLab obviously for issue tracking and project planning uh, where we need to tackle that. And we also of course do have some email I will say that having come from uh, Google, uh, the use of email decreased by five or 10 X uh, when I came to GitLab and the efficiency went up drastically. Email is not well suited to uh, keep people on the same page. It's very hard to add someone new. It's very hard to add context. It's hard to give feedback. Many, many, many things it is not designed for. It is called email. It's mail, it's mail style, it's not project planning, it's not issue tracking. So use it uh, as you need to, but we'd say that's probably the one we use the least. Hey Brandon, um, can, I, can I add a point there? 
Heck yeah. yeah. And Darren, everyone you guys know, Darren, quick introduction. Darren is our head of remote. Uh, this coincidentally came along way before what we're working through today. Uh, and Darren is the reason you guys see what you see and it's been nice to curate it in a way for you to use. So Darren, please, this is your deck. So I'll take your coaching. <laughs> no, thanks. I, I just saw, I looked ahead and saw that there was a question coming on. Oh, basic perfect. Feedback. And I, I just love this because we, we try to keep it as minimized as possible. And I would say for people that have been thrust into a work from home environment, there's a lot of chaos. There's like your kids are now home from school. Like suddenly you became a teacher. Maybe your SO is also working from home. Maybe your home wasn't quite set up for it. And the last thing you need is an additional layer of chaos of like, here's an additional tool to learn. Obviously, if you absolutely have to have something, then that's something uh, different. But the reason I, I like to focus on this slide is there's the Gmail icon, but we're, we use G Suite in a broader perspective. And what I encourage people to do is instead of instinctively adding a new tool, maybe a remote focus tool, think about what you're, you're using already. And is there a different way to use the tools that you're already using? And the example here is if you're using the G Suite, but you're not really using Google Docs extensively. Well, there's nothing stopping you from starting the process of appending a Google Doc to every meeting going forward. So now your meetings become more productive, more inclusive, more asynchronous overnight, and you didn't have to introduce a new tool at all. You just took a look at what your existing tool stack was and slightly changed your thinking of how could we use this in a more remote friendly way. Uh, so if you're using Office 365 or G Suite, that's just one thing of, you know, take, a, take a step back, Look at what you might not be taking full advantage of, and are there ways to tweak that and use that in a new way? And edit on the fly, like added Google Drive in here, because I was realizing that that would be useful when we call it Google Docs and maybe a G Suite. So iterative, I'm going to go edit this and be like, yes, helpful on that. Darren, that was awesome, and thank you. Uh, team will hit the last couple, and then we're going to do what we love most, which is really Q&A. Um, so the last one is here is this is the playbook and we want you to go use this. So there's a, a, a ebook that we put out that summarize this. And I think this is really useful if you are trying to convey this uh, upstream, perhaps to someone else uh, in your company uh, that you're looking and this is an idea that you'd like to, to surface. That said, behind all of what you're seeing here, scroll through, these are the details as to why, which I think is one of the questions that might not be as hard to answer anymore. I think most people have now come to a remote is a really important piece. Uh, the piece behind this that's really important is the how, right? What are the processes behind it? And that's where we'd encourage you uh, to leverage the uh, report if it's of use, and that's the why and what we've seen after doing this for five, six years at uh, the largest scale uh, and, and what we've experienced, and then the how you contribute here would be where you could go in and take these processes uh, if you want to get started and leverage from the ones we already have. And with that, what we've always wanted to do is quick, get as quickly as possible to Q&A. And so uh, that said, we're going to shift over and I'm going to go back to faces. Another piece that we would share is as much as possible, have a camera. So one of the things that uh, we have an opportunity to do here is actually get closer to each other. Uh, and we are right now, we are going through for every person in every space are dealing with this in, in different, different ways and different stressors. One of the things that's kind of neat about working from home uh, and is counterintuitive to what I think what most people might say, uh, my coworkers know my family because they're here. They're a part of this. That's a piece of what we're going through, but it's just a piece of being all remote. And so, Ironically, while I don't physically spend nearly as much time with people that I work with, the people I work with actually know me at a much deeper level because they are going to see all of where I'm at. And so clearly there's times that a camera doesn't make sense, uh, but we would encourage you as much as possible to have a camera on, uh, be interactive from that standpoint. My kids haven't come in to print anything today, but if they did, you know, welcome them over and make them a part of what you're doing. We all need desperately in these times to have this human connection. And ironically, this may give us a chance to get through this better than we might have if this was something we had to do in an office. And so we're pretty encouraged about where it is. We know it's hard 
And so we're here to try and help others if, if there's questions. So uh, I'll pause there. Anything else from Daniel, one thing, Michael? One thing Michael, I'll just go. share on that point, um, the cameras on thing is important in, in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that we support that, as Brandon's saying, is, is it takes a lot of repetition as managers and leaders to set the norm that it's okay. Keep your camera on. Don't worry about having a perfect environment. There's going to be noise. The dog's going to bark sometimes. Use your mute when you're not talking. That's fine. But we get it. You're like Life is going on around us, and that's totally okay. We don't want people to err on the side of no camera just because they're trying to be uh, unobtrusive. Um, if we were in a meeting at work, we'd all see each other. And this is no different. We're in a meeting at work. Let's see each other. And we get all that context. We can see the emotion. We can see... You know, I talk with my hands a lot. Brandon can tell <laughs> when I'm animated because my we hands. We both do. Um, so, uh, you know, we encourage that. And, and even, you know, we even have some statements at GitLab that it's not a rule. Uh, if there's a reason to turn off your camera, fine. But in general, the, the fundamental expectation is that it's on. If I'm eating lunch, I eat lunch with my camera on. Because if I brought my lunch into a conference room, you'd see me eating my lunch. It's no different. And it's okay. And nobody's really focused on my my screen when I'm not talking anyway, it's okay. And we all just participate together. So uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that one up, Brandon. Um, actually, I actually added a link uh, in the conversation. We have a subsection uh, in our meetings handbook page that's entitled meetings are about the work, not the background. And very simply, it means you can drop the stigma associated with whatever your background is or whatever is happening. I think what's happening with COVID-19 has catapulted us beyond the situation where people tried to make their background look as sterile as possible if they weren't in the office to somewhat mimic, like I'm actually in an office, believe me. It's like, we all get it. We're all in this together. We're all at home now. The meetings are about connecting as humans, not about the background. And I think that's one of the big positives that will come out of this is people will kind of drop that and they won't hold themselves uh, accountable for what's, what's in the background. It's, it's all about the work. It's all about connecting with people. Should we jump into the questions? Yeah. Um, question wise, a couple things here that we'll do. So we can answer the questions. Uh, we'll read them. Uh, we may, we're going to pause at the beginning of if it is your question and you would like to verbalize it. Uh, one of the things we like to do here is certainly the written piece helps us understand where we're going. And you can see a lot of it is kind of answered. That said, the context of someone actually getting to verbally say it oftentimes brings a bunch of context that wasn't particularly obvious. So uh, we'd encourage you, if you would like to answer, uh, ask the question, we'll pause for a second and give uh, anyone a chance to verbalize it. If not, uh, we can read it. So, um, Number five, I think, is the, the first number one. Number five it is. Okay, I'll take it and I'll read it and say, question on this one, what's the basic tool set to work remotely in an effective way? Um, Darren, you want to do this and then maybe we can add some other context, but Darren, go ahead. Yeah, and actually, maybe before Darren goes to the tools, the one thing that I would add to this is there's two things that are kind of important together here. Tools and process. <laughs> and what Darren's going to talk about is minimizing the number of tools. Um, inherently, in doing this things the same way every time, you're also minimizing the ways you're having calls and meetings. At GitLab, for example, we always do every call exactly the same way. Every call starts with a meeting request that gets sent to the calendar. So it's always on your calendar. In that meeting request, there is one link. The one link is to a Google Doc. That's the agenda for that call. And in that agenda, there will be links to any prep material that I might need to read before that meeting. That's also the same document where the notes will be taken, just like we have on the screen here um, during that call. So when the meeting ends, there will be one set of notes. But what's important is I don't have to worry before any call to know, well, do I need to check email to see if Brandon sent the agenda out there? Did someone slack me the content for this call? When the meeting starts, I find that when I join calls that are not run this way, there's five to seven, sometimes even 10 minutes of time lost where everyone's discussing, hey, uh, where did you put the notes? Um, Tom, you sent out a deck yesterday. Is that the most recent one? And you lose time at GitLab because we know it's the same way every time we lose no time at the beginning of the conversation. The meeting starts and we're ready to go because everyone knows where to find exactly what they need and they know 
they don't have to look anyplace else because it's not going to be hidden in some third tool because Brandon always runs his meetings one way and Mike runs them another. So that consistency of how you run the meetings is as important as how few tools you use. So uh, Darren, you want to talk about the tools? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, I laugh because it's so accurate. Um, tools are just like anything else. They can be used for good or for evil and just throwing a tool in front of someone and then letting them to their own devices. Like everyone could use that tool slightly differently. So there's the tooling, but then there's the documentation around how do we use this tool? Remove all ambiguity about how the tool is used. Be very explicit about how you use the tool so that everyone is on the same page about how this tool is used in your organization. G Suite is a great example. You just hand someone a Google Doc, they could use it a million different ways. But if you say, this is how we're using the Google Doc, we're appending it to each meeting invite, uh, and it, it needs to be there before the meeting begins. Otherwise, you can decline this meeting. That is a very prescriptive way. So the tool goes hand in hand with the process. So GitLab on the whole is a pretty minimal tool stack. We use GitLab, the product to manage our code and as well as our projects. So even our non-dev teams and marketing, we run our events, all of our projects in GitLab, the product. And this is because it's an amazing tool for asynchronous communication. You can lay out ideas and concepts and visions in a very prescriptive, precise, detailed way, tag the appropriate parties, you then give them time to respond in a way that makes sense for them. Uh, and then you have this permanent train of thought, this, this amazing amount of context and detail so that even people that join the company a year from now can look back at an issue and a discussion that was had now and understand the context around it. And so it, it plugs knowledge gaps in a major way that and at scale and over time, we gain massive efficiencies from that. We use Zoom for video. Zoom scales really well. We had a call the other week with over 600 people on simultaneously. Uh, just last week, our entire marketing department had a talent show. So we had over 130 people across six continents sign up to showcase their various talents on camera. And we had a judging panel and prizes were given out. So just one of the unique ways that you can use Zoom to actually encourage interpersonal relationships and team building in a way that would be fundamentally impossible in an office. We use G Suite as we have talked about Google Docs, Google Slides, things like that. And we use Slack, and I just want to quickly touch on Slack. We don't use it for what most other companies use it for. So we expire our Slack messages after 90 days, and that is a forcing function to work remote first. And I've linked here uh, a number of other forcing functions that you may want to consider. You put these safeguards in place to kind of turn your default, and soon enough, it'll become second nature, but not immediately. So you say, if we, we don't use Slack for work because everything vanishes after 90 days. What do you use it for? It actually solves another problem with remote teams, which is how do you get people to build relationships and stay connected? So we primarily use Slack for informal communications. We have a lot of public topical channels, things like music, hiking, mental health, uh, parenting. The parenting one of late has been quite the place to be uh, with now have a lot of uh, parents having kids home from school. And it's, a, it's an amazing venue for informal communications where parents can say like, hey, my, my kids are home. They're not cooperating. Does anyone else have a raucous seven-year-old? Do they have any tips on wrangling this crazy human? And we can have genuine, real conversations about that. And we've even spun up a new channel called the Juice Box Chat channel where parents can schedule Zoom calls with other parents to let their kids from around the world uh, share each, uh, with each other on video, speak different languages to each other, share music and educational lessons. So we've use the tools that we've already had in new ways. We're very adaptable. So that's why I say it's not fully about the tool. Like we've used Zoom for years, but we've never thought to use it to let our kids connect when they're all home from school. Uh, but as soon as the opportunity presented itself, it was a natural thing for us to do. Brandon uh, and team, uh, this question is, is, is mine, but I, I'd like to ask you a, a different question, to be honest. Uh, I'd like to hear from you how GitLab handles uh, security-related uh, issues. So, for example, now that everybody's working from home, right, how do you prevent sensitive information to leak because you don't have control over the environment that people are, wor are working on, data privacy, cybersecurity, to use VPN, uh, how, how do you handle um, security related issues? And I went ahead and added that as uh, question number nine, so we can take notes down there. Perfect, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll cover, okay. yeah, I can cover a couple of these, which is, uh, so uh, because of GitLab, so one of these, I'm acknowledging the fact that as a younger company, uh, we've been able to adopt and use tools that have a lot of this built in 
Uh, so you look at most of what we can operate as a SaaS based tool. Uh, clearly some of the control and security controls of a SaaS based tool mean, for example, we don't need to run a VPN, right? Um, we also spend a lot of time though. We have an internal team, uh, internal security team that focuses on GitLab security and they do document that through, uh, a lot of blogs and in the handbook. So if you're looking for that, it's certainly something we've been, uh, very transparent about the tools we use. Uh, we use Okta for security, for validation. Uh, we also leverage and think through the world from uh, a perspective called zero trust. Uh, that idea is, is fundamentally was, was originally originated, I believe, at Google. Uh, but the idea behind a zero trust uh, network is that you are operating in a way that uh, you understand the end device, you understand the applications that the device is trying to access, and based off the uh, how much you trust the device and the network it happens to sit on, for example, if I'm dialing in from my own home ISP all the time, hey, you know, it's coming from my back MacBook and that's the ISP, that's pretty secure. So I might just throw, you know, uh, just give you one uh, two factor authentication. However, I might need to refactor that if Brandon goes out and logs in from the WeWork, hmm, that looks interesting. So we spent a lot of time around that and I, um, I will look up that link here, Daniel, for you real quick. I'm not real good at talking and finding links same time, but I will add that in here. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if you, Michael or Darren, if you guys wanted to add anything else on that. Yeah, no, I, think you, I think you covered it well. We, you know, we benefit from the fact that we, we built our model is expecting this. So the zero trust model has worked really well for us. From a desktop IT perspective, um, it really does operate that way for each, uh, each team member, which simplifies a few things. We don't have to necessarily provision laptops in a particular way. Um, we don't have to be prescriptive about which specific device you access our tools from. We are very prescriptive about the way you access them. So um, I, I multi-factor here at GitLab more often than I've done at any other company. Um, so I, we are, you know, I'm constantly challenged depending on the tool. So if it's in an HR, uh, you know, sensitive database type system, um, I'm going to be two factoring almost every time I log into that system. Um, if not more than multi-factor. So that gives us the confidence that we're both able to manage the users and the access permissions, but we also have some process around making sure we maintain the, uh, the permissions. So even though I was granted access to certain systems and I do need to multi-factor on a regular basis, we are revisiting and reapproving each team member's access to those tools. So I, as a manager, regularly have to reapprove access for my team members to certain systems um, just to refresh that and make sure that we're keeping that user list as current as possible, even for a current team member. Do they really need access to that tool? Have they always? And we're maintaining that level of control as well. So it's, uh, it's worked very well for us uh, because we are able to leverage um, the investment from much bigger companies than us in the security of those SaaS tools. Um, and really the security that we focus on uh, AppSec and, and uh, uh, operating security for uh, our own SaaS product that we offer is really around that system and that infrastructure for the SaaS offering we provide. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to cheat and go back up a smidge. I think the tooling question was on number five. Number six, Daniel, do you want to go ahead and ask another question? I think you've got a question here that you... Uh, yes, uh, I, I think we have already a very comprehensive uh, response to this, but uh, of course, when we are managing people remotely, right, uh, it's based on results, right? But we know that sometimes the results may come and sometimes we may miss deadlines, we may miss right, uh, the target, right? Yep. So what I hear people saying sometimes is that, okay, when, when, when everybody is okay, it's fine, right? You can remote work from whatever you want, but when you miss a deadline, for example, did it happen because it was supposed to happen for many other factors, or it happened because you didn't put the time, the focus or the energy enough to, to, to make it happen, right? So we know that everybody now, we have kids at home, we have a lot of distractions. So how to remove the skepticism that things are not going well 
not because it's tough to, to accomplish, the goal, but uh, because we have more distractions now uh, in our uh, work environment, which is our home right now. Yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll start out on that one, maybe, Brandon. I, I typed in a bunch of notes while we were, we were uh, talking earlier. Um, we have two values uh, in our, our list of values. All of the values are on our handbook um, that are really important for this one. The first one is results. We really try to make sure that everything we're measuring and everything we're defining in terms of the work we're going to do has a clear expected result. That way it's something we can measure. That's not hours, not how much time you put in. It will likely require you to put in time and hours in order to get that result. But the key thing we worry about is that output. And we try to, to set pretty aspirational goals. We, they're going to be stretch goals. They're going to be hard to achieve. And the second piece that's critical is results plus iteration. And iteration is then breaking down that result into a small set of, of mini results and uh, steps forward as possible. So that you, know, you talk about missing a deadline, that shouldn't be a surprise because much, much earlier, we would have seen, hey, I was gonna train, and I put an example up here, if we were going to maybe, uh, if my, the desired result was that I was gonna complete 60 hours of training for 200 team members on some, uh, some new capabilities we'd like them to be able to take on. Um, two months from now, if you checked in with me and said, hey, is that done? And I said, oh, we're way behind. We should never get to that point. What we should do is, well, this week, I'm gonna complete the first round of curriculum and we're gonna train one person on that first chapter just to see how it works. And we're gonna get the tool loaded with that content, make sure the tool's working. So at the end of that week, if I can say I accomplished A, B, and C, you know I'm on track. I'm progressing towards the, the big outcome we want. If I didn't get them done, we can address it right now but you didn't have to kind of be leaning over my back and saying, is Mike working a full day each day? Is he really on getting those hours done? You should be seeing those deliverables happening, those small steps forward. And if not, we can all jump in and figure out what, what do we need to debug? What's the problem? And I might say, oh, gee, we thought the tool worked. The tool doesn't work. It's going to take another week for us to get the tool working. Great. We've got a new objective now. And we're still going to try to get ourselves back on track for the big result. So that iteration is really important. And it's hard. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest challenges at GitLab is for someone who's been in, a, in an environment where you do have a little bit more just physical proximity and you can see people typing, they're working on stuff. If they have a question, they might ask you. Um, we want people to break these things down and understand that it's okay to be imperfect. Uh, so that means I want to have this great curriculum to train these 200 people, but I'm going to share the first two pages of the curriculum as soon as I've written those first two pages, just so that we can get eyes on it. And two things happen. One, I can see that, hey, the first two pages are done. There's progress being made. I can also say, hey, gosh, I, <laughs> I'm glad we checked just after the first two pages because I think we had envisioned something different and we course correct right up front. So those two things are really important um, for the remote management. Um, the, the, a subtle one at GitLab is, um, is transparency. And I encourage every company, no matter how transparent you are internally, we're very transparent. The more you can publicly share and communicate those objectives. So even if it's in a weekly team meeting and a standup where everyone can see a document, here's the things Mike's trying to get done. And I can see everything that Dan's trying to get done. Um, and we can see how those are progressing. That adds, acts as a great motivator for two things. One for me to try to get them done because I don't want to be the person at the update, not having gotten my things done. But two, you know you're going to hear from me if I'm not on track because I don't want to be the person that didn't have my stuff done. So I'm going to raise it really early and say, oh, I've, I've encountered a problem and you can solve it quickly. I you Thank you very much. much. By the way, I was having a meeting with Brandon a few weeks ago and he asked me to bring the MVC, right? It's the minimum viable change, right? So that was the first time I heard such acronym. But now I'm aware and applying that. Yeah, because yeah, because we're all you know we're all aspirational. We're all trying to get the best possible result, and that comes after the first step. So, okay, what is the first step? Let, let's do that. And that minimum viable thing is often a hard thing for people to feel comfortable with because it feels like it's not my best work. If I put another ten hours into it, it'd certainly be better than that minimum thing. But hey, let's start with the minimum, and we'll go from there. 
I'd say the one last thing on this is in fairness, uh, much like we have the, the being remote gets us closer and I, for me has been much easier to get closer to my colleagues. It will also mean that you have to be a better manager. So you need to understand and set those expectations. So this does put some more weight, uh, but I think it's good expectations. It's what a manager should be doing anyway. Uh, it does require that you define those well, you're regularly checking in, and you, you're, you're on that with your, with your team. So um, I don't think that's any changes from what you would want in a great manager in person. Uh, but as it turns out, it's one that you will need to do in writing and everything a bit better than uh, you might otherwise. I think we are reaching to the end here. I have one last question for, for you all, right? Uh, trying to be more optimistic, right? GitLab is a 100% uh, work remotely company by design, right? So what are the opportunities that now that everybody uh, has to do the same thing, right? What are the opportunities that after this whole situation is over, right? We are going to have the new normal, right? So I don't know. What are, uh, what are the opportunities that companies should pursue right now, right? After this whole situation is over, maybe people can work more from home, you can hire people from right? Uh, anywhere in the world and scale easily. Uh, how working from home uh, has been uh, a, a advantage for, for uh, GitLab throughout all those years? I I'll take a credit. This one. Oh yeah, Darren, go ahead. I'll, I will add one and then Darren jump in. This is one that's not, that's counterintuitive. Uh, one of the things also is yes, you get talent that can be location. I think the first thing we kind of think about this from remote is location wise. Uh, we also, it also opens up your opportunity to uh, work with talent that has other limitations like need to take, take care of an, an older uh, uh, a mother or father that they need to take care of. That's someone that actually can't, you, they're not even an addressable person that can, you can have in your company if you aren't able to do this. Uh, likewise, the way that some people interact, particularly if you get to engineering, we go to personality types, right? And there's introverts offer enormous amount of value. The way that this is run, if you think just about this meeting, right? If you're an extreme introvert, you can still participate, get your input, and you get that input from some people that maybe otherwise have a much harder time. If the answer is who's the loudest voice in the room, if you're in a company, and I think there's a place there that we're just beginning to understand. Darren, please jump in. Those are two areas I've noticed that I think uh, this can help a whole lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tack onto that and say, you open up your talent pipeline to people that opt into this. So at GitLab, we have an incredibly pure recruiting pipeline because no one applies to GitLab by accident. If you go to the jobs FAQ on our website, I actually wrote a section entitled, what's it like to work at GitLab? with three paragraphs and four links. And I'm confident that if you read that, you will have a firm understanding of what it's like to work here. And if it's for you, you're gonna to proceed to apply. And if it's not, neither of us are gonna waste our time. You know, people should put their strategy, their vision, be honest with themselves about what it is like to work at a place out there so that people opt into it. And then once they're into it at a remote setting, people understand that this is, this is an incredible privilege an incredible uh, luxury. And so our retention rate is well above the industry average because the people that opt into this, they value that autonomy and that flexibility to live and work where their soul is most fulfilled. That's a big thing for them. And in a lot of cases, it's more important than salary. It's more important than title and ego and prestige. I say it's the last great competitive advantage. It, is, it enables a lot of startups to maintain talent that would otherwise be poached by someone who could just write a bigger check. Because to some degree, there's no amount of money that can replace ultimate autonomy and empowerment that comes with uh, being able to work remotely. I also think this COVID-19 situation uh, has essentially let the genie out of the bottle and there's no putting it back in. For years and years, a lot of people have been told you can't do your job remotely. And now we're proving that in a week, in the worst of circumstances, we're so adaptable that in fact, many jobs can be done remotely. Maybe not optimally, but we're going to iterate on that. And three or four months from now, people are going to have their workspaces dialed in. And I think it's going to trigger a sea change in people collectively looking at each other and saying, hey, we just did this. We did it differently. And in the process, we became more fluent in remote and we built remote infrastructure. And now it's become a fabric of who we are as a company. 
And so I think there's the here and now of stabilizing and making business work in a remote setting that you didn't see coming. But this is also the chance to press pause and hit reset and lay the right infrastructure in doing this well, such that even when the world returns to normal, and even if some people do choose to go back to the office, you're set up for more communication to be seamless across your entire organization. Even if you're talking about employees that are on floor three versus floor five, they're remote to each other. So even if they're in that same building, but they're a couple of floors apart, laying some of the groundwork that we've talked about today will even help them communicate better. So it makes sense for companies to embrace it. In many ways, companies are all remote already. If you have two headquarters in two different time zones, they're remote to each other. And this is a, an interesting moment in time where it's a chance to recognize that and lay the right groundwork and infrastructure. And uh, it can become a really vital part of your operational strategy, even if it's put together just for now for stabilization purposes. Awesome. Thank you. Tina, I think we're pretty much time. Do you want to end us and also suggest if there's anything that people have further questions, how we can help engage them? And, and before, before you wrap, just for, for everyone uh, on the call, you know, as we've been, been having this conversation, we've been capturing all these notes in the Google Doc. Um, this is yours to use yourself. It's also for yours to share. Feel free to send this to anyone that you want in your organization, beyond your organization. This is something that we want to make sure uh, we all benefit from. Uh, you know, you notice there was a question about security. Brandon was able to quickly link to a link that already has a lot of additional content on that. Uh, no need to go re redo that work down the road for someone who might just benefit from uh, looking at this note doc. So please feel free to share it. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And for everybody here, if you have a specific question that we didn't address today, feel free to reach us out. Uh, we are here to help each other. And for everybody, uh, stay safe. And that's it. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much for being here. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks.